This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed at home. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none. And this little piggy cried, Wee, 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 all the way home. We present John Moffat as Hercule Poirot in Agatha Christie's Five Little Pigs. Hercule Poirot's Apartment, London, 1938. it said in your letter. It tells me very little, mademoiselle. Why have you come to see me? My name isn't really Carla. It's Caroline, the same as my mother. I was called after her. Caroline Le Marchand? No, not Le Marchand. My real name is Crail. Crail? I seem to remember... My father was a painter, rather a well-known one. Ah, Emius Crail. A great painter, some would say. I think he was. And my mother, Caroline Crail, was put on trial for murdering him. Ah, yes, I remember now. It was a long time ago. Sixteen years ago. And your mother was found guilty. They didn't hang her. They said there were extenuating circumstances. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. But she died only a year after her trial. And so? I was only five years old at the time. I knew there was something wrong, but nobody would tell me. I went away on a ship to live with Uncle Simon and Aunt Louise in Montreal. That's when I became Carlo Le Marchand. In the end, I forgot that I'd ever had any other name. And then, mademoiselle? It wasn't until I was twenty that I learned the truth. They gave me the letter. Letter? The letter my mother left for me when she died. That's when I realized that she'd been accused of murder. Oh, my poor child. I don't want your sympathy. What made it so much more difficult was that I was engaged to be married. And you told your fiancé? Of course. Some would not. What was his reaction? He said it didn't matter. He didn't care. But it matters to you. It matters very much to me. It isn't the past that worries me. It's the future. We want to have children, you see. And we don't want to watch our children growing up and be afraid of what they may become. Tell me, mademoiselle, how was your father killed? He was poisoned. And you fear for your children? And for yourself. That's understandable, surely. Mm Mm-hmm. But what is it that you want of me? What can I do? I'm not going to get married until I know what really happened. I want you to investigate the case for me. But, my dear young lady, after 16 years... My mother was innocent. Well, naturally, of course. No, there's no of course about it. She left the letter for one reason, that I should know she was not a murderess, that I could be sure of it. Always. Good man, mademoiselle. No. My mother would never have told me a lie. If she says she didn't kill my father, then she didn't kill him. I know that. But I want it to be made certain. For my fiancé and for my children. And you're the only man who can do it. But after so many years... I know about you. It's the psychology of crime that interests you, isn't it? Not the footprints and the cigarette ends. You'll go over all the facts of the case, talk to the people who were there, and then lie back in your chair and think. The little grey cells. And then you will tell me what really happened. I am honoured, mademoiselle. I will investigate your case of murder. I will find out the truth. I knew I could trust you, Monsieur Poirot. No, 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 no. I said I would find out the truth. But if I find that your mother was guilty... What then? I'm her daughter. I want the truth. Yeah, very well. Then tell me where shall I begin? Who was the counsel for your mother's defense? A very distinguished lawyer, Sir Montague de Pleach. Not one of my great successes, I'm afraid. All the same, I think I did all that could humanly be done. One can't do much without cooperation. We did get it commuted to penal servitude. Provocation, you know. There was a lot of sympathy for her at the time. Even so, Sir Montague, a life sentence... Oh, if she'd stuck a knife into him or shot him, I'd have gone for manslaughter. But poison? There's the element of premeditation, you see. 
What was the defence? Suicide. Suicide? Only thing you could go for. But it didn't go down very well. Crail simply wasn't that kind of man. Great womanizer, great drinker, went in for the lusts of the flesh and enjoyed them. You can't persuade a jury that a man like that is going to sit down and quietly do away with himself. I was on a losing wicket from the start. And she wouldn't play up at all. Caroline Crail. She didn't even try to put up a fight. I knew we'd lose as soon as she went into the box. She didn't seem there half the time. Why did she not put up a fight? Difficult to say. She loved the fellow, I suppose. I don't believe she recovered from the shock after she came to herself and realised what she'd done. So, in your opinion, she was guilty? Frankly, putting aside my official role in the affair, I don't think there's much doubt about it. Oh, yes, she did it all right. But what was the evidence against her? It was very damning indeed. I saw that from the start. First of all, there was the motive. Hmm? She and Crail had led a kind of cat and dog life for years. He was always getting mixed up with some woman or another, and Mrs. Crail wasn't the meek sort who suffers in silence. There would be a flaming row, the affair would blow over, and Amos Crail would come back to her. But this time it was different. In what way different? The girl in question was very young, not more than twenty. She was very beautiful. What was her name? Elsa Greer. She was the only daughter of some manufacturer up in Yorkshire. She had money and determination, and she knew what she wanted. She wanted Amias Crail. She got him to paint her. Crail wasn't exactly what you'd call a society portrait artist, but he agreed to do a picture of her, and he fell in love with her. He was getting on for forty, and he'd been married a good many years. He was just right to make a fool of himself over some chit of a girl. He was crazy about her. And he wanted to get a divorce and marry her. And Caroline Crail knew of this? Elsa Greer wasn't the kind to let grass grow under her feet. She told her. It all blew up after lunch on the day before the murder. Amias wasn't there when it started. You know, this would be a lovely room, if it were properly fixed. There's too much furniture. When I'm living here, I shall take all the rubbish out and just leave one or two pieces. And I shall have... Copper-coloured curtains, I think, so that the setting sun will just catch them through the big western window. Don't you think that would be lovely, Philip? Are you thinking of buying this place, then, Elsa? <laughs> it won't be necessary for me to buy it. What is that supposed to mean? Must we pretend? Come on, Caroline, you know very well what I mean. I've no idea. Don't be such an ostrich. It's no good pretending you don't know all about it. Amias and I love one another. You've seen that clearly enough. This isn't your home. After we're married, I shall live here with him. And at that point, apparently, Amias wandered in. Caroline asked him straight out. Elsa says you intend to marry her. Is this true? Why the devil couldn't you hold your tongue? Then it is true. I don't want to discuss it. I think it's only fair to Caroline that she should be told. Is it true, Amias? Answer me, please. I've got to know. And, of course, he couldn't deny it. And what was the reaction of Caroline Crail? According to witnesses, she told Elsa that she'd kill him rather than give him up to her. Who were the witnesses? The governess. And an old friend of Amos, Philip Blake. And she was convicted of poisoning her husband. Did they establish how she came by the poison? The day before the murder, they all went to take tea with Philip Blake's brother Meredith at Handcross Manor. Crail's house overlooked the sea, and Handcross was a short distance away over the other side of the creek. Meredith Blake was a dabbler in herbs and hand-brewed medicines, and one of his little brews was conine, spotted hemlock. Quite an effective poison. The next day, Meredith Blake noticed that half the contents of the bottle had gone, got the wind up about it. After Crail's death, the police found an almost empty scent bottle with traces of conine in Mrs. Crail's room. Hidden away at the bottom of a drawer. Somebody might have put it there. Oh, no. She admitted to the police that she'd taken it. Oh, for what reason? She told them she'd thought of doing herself in. She couldn't explain how the bottle came to be empty, nor how it was that only her fingerprints were on it. That was what made it so tricky for us. If Crail had committed suicide, he'd have taken the poison from the scent bottle in her room, and his fingerprints would have been on the bottle as well as hers. How was the cognine administered? It was given to him in a glass of beer. Mrs. Crail got the bottle out of the refrigerator and took it down to him herself. 
He was painting Elsa Greer in a place they called the uh, Battery Garden. Mrs. Crail poured out the beer, gave it to him, and watched him drink it. He, he tossed it down in one draught, a habit of his. Everyone went up to lunch and left him to his painting. And who found him? Mrs. Crail and the governess. He was dead by then. Mrs. Crail's story was that the beer she gave him was all right. The theory that we tried to put across was that he was overcome with guilt and remorse and slipped the poison in himself. It didn't wash, of course. There was the evidence of the fingerprints, for one thing. They found the fingerprints of Mrs. Crail on the bottle? No, they didn't. They found only his, and they were phony. She was alone with a body, you see, while the governess went to find a doctor. And what she must have done was to wipe the bottle and glass and then press his fingers on them. But she got the prints in a position in which no man could hold a bottle. The prosecution had a lot of fun with that. The cognac must have been put into the bottle before she took it down to the garden. There was no cognac in the bottle at all, only in the glass. It, it had been in one of those uh, pipette things. Uh, the police found it crushed to splinters on the path up to the house. I don't think there is a shadow of a doubt that she did it. And yet when she died in prison, she left a letter to be given to her daughter in which she swore solemnly that she was innocent. I dare say she did. I'd have done the same myself. Uh, her daughter says that she was not that kind of person. But what could she possibly know about it? She can't be more than five at the time. Honestly, Poirot, you're not going to get anywhere with this one. She did it. No, 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 my friend, I cannot leave it at that. I must satisfy myself. I must talk to all those who were involved. After sixteen years? I don't even know whether they're all still alive. Who would know? The Crail solicitors were Jonathan and Jonathan. Old Caleb Jonathan's still around, he'd certainly know. He's retired now, lives somewhere in darkest Essex. De Preach made a very bad job of it. He completely misjudged Caroline Crail. He wanted her to put on a performance in court. She couldn't do that. What kind of woman was she? It is most important that I get to understand her. To see how she came to do what she did? Perhaps. She was a turbulent, unhappy creature. I knew her, of course, before she married Amias Crail. Caroline Spaulding she was then. Her mother was left a widow early in life, and Caroline was devoted to her. Then the mother married again. There was another child, a daughter, Angela. It was very sad, very painful. A typical case of adolescent jealousy. Caroline Crail was jealous of her little stepsister? Passionately so. There was a most regrettable incident. Poor child. Caroline blamed herself bitterly afterwards. What happened? She threw a paperweight at her. The baby lost the sight of one eye and was permanently disfigured. Oh. Was this mentioned at the trial? It was. You can imagine the effect it had on the jury. It gave the impression that she was a woman of ungovernable temper. That was not true. Hmm. How did she come to marry Emmius Crail? She was a friend of the family, and of his sister in particular. She often stayed at Alderbury. And she got to know Amos's friends from Handcross Manor nearby, Philip and Meredith Blake. Philip was a nasty, money-grubbing little brute, but Amias thought the world of him. Meredith was what we used to call namby-pamby. Uh -huh. <laughs> Liked botany and butterflies and watching birds. And both the Blake brothers were at the house when Amias Crail was killed? Yes, they were. Amias was like all the Crails, a restless egoist. He loved Caroline, but he never once considered her feelings. He did as he pleased. He had affairs with women, but he left them high and dry when he'd finished with them. He always came back to Caroline. She was the only woman he cared for, really. It might have gone on like that if he hadn't run into Elsa Greer. Ah, now tell me about her. Poor child, poor child. You feel like that about her? Maybe it is because I am an old man, but I find, Monsieur Poirot, that there is something about the defenselessness of the young that moves me to tears. Elsa Greer was a spoiled child of fortune, a kind of predatory Juliet, young, ruthless, but horribly vulnerable staking everything on one audacious throw. Which she nearly won. And then, at the last moment, death stepped in, and the living, ardent, joyous Elsa died also. There was left only a, 
a vindictive, cold, hard woman, hating with all her soul the person who had done this thing. But she's still alive? Oh, yes. She married well, Lord Dietisham. But I suspect that she is not happy. And what has happened to the other people who were at Aldebrae at the time of the murder? Oh, they are all alive. Philip and Meredith Blake, Angela Warren... And Mrs. Clare's stepsister? She was there also? Yes, she was. She lived with Caroline. She's become a very distinguished woman now. Travels in all sorts of weird and remote places and writes books about them. Lectures at the Royal Geographical Society, too. Mm. And there was a fifth person, I think. Miss Williams, the governess. But the child's governess or Angela Warren's? Angela's, although she used to give some lessons to little Caroline, I think. And where was little Caroline at the time? She was staying with her grandmother, Lady Tresillion. Is it on Miss Caroline's behalf that you are examining this case? That is so. I must find out the truth. I intend to visit these five people to get from them the story of what happened. But do you suppose, Poirot, after all this time, they will remember exactly what happened? I fear you will hear five separate accounts of five separate murders. Ah, that is exactly what I am counting on. It will be very instructive. Then I will do what I can to help you. Perhaps it would be best to start with Philip Blake. He is a stockbroker, very prosperous, I believe. This little piggy went to market. I thought you were supposed to be a famous detective. I am grateful that I am so well known to you. So why are you investigating something that's been over and done with for 16 years? As I said in my letter, I am researching a book on famous crimes. And so the whole unsavoury business is going to be raked up all over again. It will all be treated with the utmost sensitivity. I want to recreate the past, to feel and see the events that took place, to see behind the obvious... That damned woman killed my best friend. That's all there is to it. And if I had acted quicker, I could have saved him. What do you mean by that, Mr. Blake? I take it you already know the main facts of the case? I do, yes. I was staying at Alderbury on that morning, the morning Amos was poisoned. My brother Meredith rang me up. He was in a fair old state. One of his hell brews was missing. It was a pretty lethal brew, and... What did I do? I told him to come over and talk about it. Decide what was best to be done. Decide! What I should have done was to go to Amos straight away and tell him that Caroline had pinched one of his patent poisons and that he and Elsa ought to look out for themselves. There was no doubt in your mind that it was Mrs. Crail who had taken the poison? Of course not. You see, Poirot, I knew Caroline very well. She wasn't the ingenue innocent she was made out to be at the time of the trial. Ah, what was she then? If you really want to know, she was rotten. Rotten, through and through. She had a sweetness of manner that deceived everybody. And a frail, helpless look about her that appealed to people's chivalry. I sometimes think that Mary Queen of Scots must have been a bit like her. Sweet and unfortunate and magnetic. And actually a cold, calculating, scheming bitch who planned the murder of her husband and got away with it. You've heard what she did to her sister? Please tell me. She couldn't bear to have a rival for her mother's affection. She tried to kill the baby with a crowbar, smash its head in. She had to be first... That was a thing she simply could not stand, not being first. You had known her for a long time? Since she first came to stay at Alderbury. She knew just what she was after. She gave us all the once over. I was never in the running, younger son with no money. She considered Meredith for a bit, but she finally settled for Amos. She realised what an extraordinary talent he had. She gambled on his being not only a genius but a financial success as well, and she was right, of course. Do you know Amos's work? I regret to say that I have seen very little. There's one here in the dining room. Come and look at it. There. That's Amos. Quite astonishing. A simple vase of flowers on a polished table, but the roses burn like fire. And the table has a life altogether of its own. And the man who painted it was cut short in his prime because of a cruel and malignant woman. And yet I have heard that Mrs. Crail had much to put up with in her married life. Oh, yes. And didn't she let everyone know it? Poor old Amos. His married life was one long torment. A man like that should never have married. He confided in you? Well, he knew I was a loyal friend. 
He let me see things, but he didn't complain. He wasn't that sort of man. Never get married, old boy, he said to me once. Wait for hell till after this life. What about his attachment to Miss Greer? Well, I could see she was a very different proposition from his other women the moment she appeared at Alderbury. She'd got him hooked good and proper. Poor fool, fairly et out of her hand. So you did not care for Elsa Greer either? No, I did not. She was a predatory creature. She wanted Amos to be hers, body and soul. But, um, all the same, I, I think she might have been better for him than Caroline. The best thing would have been for him to have been free of all female entanglements. But it would seem that her hermit's life was not to his taste. Hmm? Tell me, was he fond of the child? Angela? Oh, we, we all liked Angela. She was always game for anything. She left that wretched governess of hers a terrible life. But was he fond of her? Oh, sometimes he went too far, and then he used to get really mad with her, and then Caroline would step in. She always sided with Angela, and Amos hated that. There was a lot of jealousy all round, you know. How do you mean? Well, Amos was jealous of the way Caroline always put Angela first, and Angela was jealous of Amos and rebelled against his overbearing ways. It was his decision that she should go to school that autumn. She was furious about it. It's not that she didn't like the idea. She just couldn't stand the high-handed way in which he'd arranged it. She played all sorts of jokes on him in revenge. One night she put slugs in his bed. Hmm. Not very pleasant, that. He was right, of course. It was time Angela got some discipline. Miss Williams simply couldn't cope. When I asked just now if Amias was fond of the child, I referred to his own child, his daughter. Oh, little Caroline. She was a great pet. He enjoyed playing with her when he was in the mood. But his affection for her wouldn't have deterred him from marrying Elsie, if that's what you're after. How did Mrs. Gray behave with her? Mm, can't say she wasn't a good mother. One thing I really regret in the whole business. I hope they managed to keep the truth from her. Ah, the truth, Mr. Blake, has a habit of making itself known, even after many years. I wonder. And in the interest of truth, I am going to ask you to do something. And what's that? I would like you to write out for me an exact account of what happened on those last days at Alderbury. But after all this time, I shall be hopelessly inaccurate. The police files will have all the detail you need, surely. Ah, but I do not want bare facts. I want what you remember, happenings and words that you never mentioned at the time, because perhaps you judged them irrelevant or preferred not to repeat them. This would not be for publication? No, 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 no. It would be for my eyes only. Very well. I'll do it. I feel I owe it, in a way, to Amos. It is very good of you. Tell me, are you going to talk to the others? I do not know whether it will be possible. You could try my brother, of course. He still lives down there in Devon at Handcross Manor, and it's next to Alderbury. In fact, he's never lived anywhere else. This little piggy stayed at home. That's Alderbury there, across the creek. Fine old house. Sixteen years ago. And you say that little Carla's a grown-up woman now? I can hardly believe it. Time flies swiftly, does it not? Too swiftly. As you will have seen from Miss Crail's letter, she is very anxious to know everything about the sad events of the past. Why? Why rake up everything again? How much better to let these ghastly things all be forgotten? Ah, you can say that because you know the past all too well, but... Carla Crail only knows the story as she learned it from the official accounts of the trial. Yes, I was forgetting that. Poor child, the reports are so soulless, so callous. And they tell nothing of the characters in the drama, of the extenuating circumstances. That's just it, the extenuating circumstances. One has to admit that Amos's conduct was frankly outrageous. Not the way you would expect a well-bred, decent man to behave, hmm? Not by my standards of conduct. But, of course, Amos was no ordinary man. He was a painter, and that was all that counted. When he was painting a picture, nothing else mattered. He was like a man in a dream, completely obsessed. And that is why this particular situation arose, hmm? Just so. He was in love with Elsa Greer. He wants to marry her. He was prepared to leave his wife and child for her. But he'd started painting her picture down here, and he was determined to finish it. He couldn't see anything else. 
and the fact that the situation was perfectly impossible for the two women concerned doesn't seem to have occurred to him. Did either of them understand his point of view? Well, Elsa did, I suppose. It was her portrait, and she was terrifically enthusiastic about it. But it was a difficult situation for her, naturally. And as for Caroline... Mm, it must have been impossible for her. I... I was always fond of Caroline. There was a time when I hoped to marry her, but that was nipped in the bud. I couldn't compete with Amias. Still, I remained devoted to her service. You must have resented the situation on her behalf. Oh, yes, I most certainly did. I actually remonstrated with Amias about it. When was this? It was the day before it all happened. They all came over here to tea. I took Crail out onto the terrace and told him he wasn't being fair to either of the women. If he meant to marry the girl, he ought not to have her staying there in the house, flaunting her in Caroline's face. And what did he say to that? Frankly, Meredith, Caroline will have to lump it. But you're making her suffer, man. Don't you see that? And what about the girl? It's a pretty rotten position for her. She'll just have to lump it, too. What you don't seem to understand, Mary, is that this thing I'm painting is the best thing I've ever done. It's good. It's different. And a couple of jealous women aren't going to upset it. No, by hell they're not. But for heaven's sake, don't you have any human decency? Painting isn't everything. It is to me. Frankly, Amos, the way you've treated Caroline is disgraceful. Do you think I don't know that? I've given Caroline the hell of a life and she's been a saint about it. But she knew when she married me what she was letting herself in for. I told her just what kind of egotistical, lecherous bastard I was. But that doesn't excuse anything. And why did it have to be broken to Caroline in such a heartless way? Wouldn't it have been better to have waited a while? I couldn't agree more, old chap. I didn't want it that way. It was Elsa who insisted on spilling the beans. She's too young to know what she's doing. She's going blindly into this thing without giving it a thought, and she might regret it bitterly afterwards. Can't you just... Pull yourself together, make a clean break with Miss Greer and go back to your wife? You're a good fellow, Mary, but much too sentimental. You wait until the picture's finished and you'll see that I was right. Evidently, Amias Crail was an incurable optimist. He was the kind of man who doesn't take women seriously. I could have told him that Caroline was desperate. Did she tell you so? Not in so many words. But I shall always see her face as it was that afternoon... White and strained with a kind of desperate gaiety. She talked and laughed a lot, but her eyes... There was a kind of anguished grief in them that was the most moving thing I have ever known. And this was on the afternoon that you showed everyone round your laboratory? Hmm? The day before the murder? Yes. I ought to have suspected something, I suppose. It was Caroline who turned the conversation to my little hobby... But what do you actually do with all these deadly little brews you concoct, Meredith? Oh, some of them are quite harmless. Dandelion tea, for example, or valerian, which can ease nervous tension. Oh, that's the stuff that smells of cat's pee. The ancients used to call it all heal. Of course, it's important to gather the plants at the right time. In the old days, certain plants were only gathered when the moon was full. Was that when they wanted to produce something particularly deadly? Well... There are certain plants that have to be picked at the right time for them to be effective. The spotted hemlock, for instance. It flowers only every second year. Hemlock? Isn't that what they made Socrates drink? Yes. He raised the cup to his lips and asked the gods to prosper his journey to the other world. He walked about until his legs began to fail and the poison slowly stole through his body until it reached the heart. His last words were, Crito... I owe a cock to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay the debt? And have you actually made hemlock yourself? Hemlock, belladonna, all sorts of deadly potions. Come into the laboratory. I'll show you. Who went with you into the laboratory? Amos didn't come. He sat out there watching the light over the sea. But all the rest did. And they were? Caroline, of course, and Philip, Angela, and Elsa Greer. That was all? Yes, I think so. Who else should there be? Well, I thought perhaps the governess... Oh, I see what you mean. No, she wasn't there that afternoon. Her name's gone right out of my head. Nice woman. But Angela worried her a good deal, I oh, think. why was that? 
Well, she was a nice kid, but she was inclined to run wild. She played some sort of trick on Amias, and he went up in smoke, insisted that she was sent away to boarding school. Uh, did Angela take kindly to the idea of boarding school? No, she didn't. She was furious with Amias, but his mind was absolutely made up. And when was she to go to school? The next term, the autumn term. They were getting her things together. There was an argument about her packing on the morning of Amias's death. And what about the governess? How do you mean? Well, she cannot have been very pleased with the idea. After all, she was being deprived of a job. Yes, I suppose you're right. They wouldn't have kept Miss Williams on just to look after little Carla. Miss Williams! Of course, that's the name. Funny how things come back when you talk about them. And you are now back in the past, are you not? Huh? You relive the scenes, the words that people said, their gestures, the expression of their faces... I certainly remember a row I had with Elsa Greer just after I learned that Amias was going to leave Caroline. I tried to point out that it was a pretty rotten thing to do. <laughs> oh, Mary, you're so old-fashioned. If two people aren't happy together, then it's better to make a clean break. Amias and Caroline go at one another like cat and dog all the time. Is that any kind of atmosphere for Angela and Carla to be brought up in? I felt all the time that she didn't really know what she was talking about. She was just rattling off things she read about in books. It's a queer thing to say, but she was pathetic somehow. So young and so self-confident. There is something about youth that can be so terribly moving. How interesting that you should say that. That's partly, I think, why I tackled Crail. He was nearly twenty years older than the girl. It didn't seem fair, but my interference achieved nothing. Do you still have your laboratory of medicines and potions? No. I abandoned it all, dismantled the place. How could I go on with it after what had happened? The whole thing, you see, might be said to be my fault. Oh, no, surely not, Mr. Blake. You're too sensitive. But don't you see? I told them all about those damn things. I boasted about the care I took in making them. I even pointed out that damned conine. Did they find any fingerprints on the bottle? Yes, hers. Not yours? No. I didn't handle the bottle, you see. Only pointed to it. And I'd given everything a thorough cleaning about five days previously. You kept the room locked up? Invariably. And when did Caroline Crail take the cognac from the bottle? She was the last to leave the room. Ah, but did you see her take it? No, I had my back to her. I was talking to Elsa Greer. I called her, I remember, and she came hurrying out. Her cheeks were just a little pink, and her eyes were wild and excited. Oh, God, I can see her now. Did you discuss the situation at all with her that afternoon? There was one moment when we were more or less alone together. I asked her what was the matter. A stupid question. Everything's the matter. Everything's gone. Finished. I'm finished, Mary. And I'll tell you this, Monsieur Poirot. When Caroline Crail said at the trial that she took the stuff for herself, I'll swear she was speaking the truth. There was no thought in her mind of murder at that time. I swear there wasn't. That came later. Are you sure that it did come later? I beg your pardon. I don't quite understand. I ask you whether you are sure that the thought of murder ever did come. Are you perfectly convinced in your own mind that Caroline Crail did deliberately commit murder? But, my dear man, if she didn't... Well, if she didn't? I can't imagine any alternative solution. Accident? Impossible, surely. Quite impossible, I should say. And I can't believe in the suicide theory. It had to be advanced, but it was quite unconvincing to anyone who knew Crail. Quite so. So what remains? There remains the possibility of Amias Crail having been killed by somebody else. But that's absurd. You think so? I'm sure of it. Who would have wanted to kill him? Who could have killed him? Well, you are more likely to know than I am. Monsieur Poirot... If there were any possibility of suspecting somebody else, I would readily believe Caroline innocent. No, there's no alternative. Nobody could have murdered Amias Crail but his wife. But he drove her to it, and so, in a way, it was suicide after all, I suppose. Meaning that he died as a result of his own actions, though not by his own hand. Tell me, Monsieur Poirot, have you spoken to anyone else? Yes, to your brother, Philip. Philip is prejudiced. Yes? There was always a certain antagonism between him and Caroline. Why? How should I know why? He was annoyed, I think, when Amias married her. Never went near them for over a year. I suppose because he was Amos's best friend, he didn't feel that any woman was good enough. 
How did your brother react to the Elsa Greer affair? Do you know, I find it rather difficult to say. He was annoyed, I think, with Amias for making a fool of himself over the girl. But at the same time, I have a feeling... Yes, very definitely I have a feeling that he was just faintly pleased at seeing Caroline let down. And after the tragedy? He was terribly cut up, totally broken by it. He was... Uh, he was terribly bitter against Caroline. He at least had no doubts, then. None of us had any doubts. But why do you have to come along and start raking it all up again? It is not I, but Caroline Crail. Caroline? What do you mean? I mean her daughter. Ah, little Carla. I misunderstood you for a moment. Uh, you thought that I meant that Caroline Crail would not... Uh, how shall I say it? Rest easy in her grave? Don't. I don't like to think about it. You know that she wrote to her daughter, the last word she ever wrote, that she was innocent. Caroline wrote that? Yes. It surprises you? It would surprise you if you'd seen her in court. Poor, haunted, defenseless creature. She had given up? No. It was more the realization that she had killed the man she loved. Or that was what I thought. You are not so sure now? To write a thing like that when she was dying. I am certain she would not have lied. But if Caroline was innocent... What do you think yourself, Monsieur Poirot? As yet, I think nothing. I collect only the impressions. What kind of people they were, all those who were involved. What happened exactly on those last few days? That is what I need, to go over the facts laboriously, one by one. Your brother is going to help me there. He is sending me an account of the events as he remembers them. He won't get much from Philip. Things slip from his memory once they're passed and done with. Probably he'll remember things all wrong. Well, perhaps that is not altogether a decent advantage. I'll tell you what, if you like, I could do the same. I mean, it would be a kind of check, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be most valuable. And uh, there is another thing I wanted to ask you. Would it be possible for me to go to Alderbury to see with my own eyes where the tragedy occurred? I can take you over there right away. Ah. We won't be able to get into the place. It's a kind of hostel now. Hordes of young people come down to it in the summer, and, of course, all the rooms have been cut up and partitioned. I am sure you will be able to convey to me how it was. I'll do my best. I wish you could have seen it in the old days. It was one of the loveliest places I know. The quickest way is along the shore. To get to Alvary by road, you have to go right inland and round the creek. But the quickest way from one house to the other is to row across the narrow stretch of water over there. Hmm. There's always a boat on the beach. A boat. <laughs> uh, quite a little adventure. <laughs> We always used to come to all the way this way in the old days. Uh -huh. ah. Unless, of course, there was a storm mm. or it was raining. Uh -huh. ah. Now, if you just take hold of the oars. The oars, oh, um, yes, of, of course. Uh, I'll hop out and make the boat fast. Uh -huh. uh, it was here that you uh, always used to tie up. There used to be a boathouse, but it's gone now. We used to walk along the shore and bathe off those rocks. There. Ah. Uh, let me give you a hand. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Oh, there we are. Oh. 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 oh, my shoes. Oh, dear. Well, the way to the house is up this path. Uh -huh. Rather a steep climb, I'm afraid. Oh, no. Oh, oh, what a, a pleasantly secluded little spot. The, uh, the cannons are particularly quiet, but uh, not genuine, I think. <laughs> not genuine at all. <sighs> this is what Amy has called the battery. He always liked to work here, if he could. Uh -huh. There used to be a tumble-down shed where he kept his painting muck and some bottled beer and a few deck chairs. There used to be a bench and a table, but it hasn't changed much. And it was uh, here that it happened? He was sprawled out on the bench, just there. 
He would often lie like that when he was painting, just fling himself down and stare. And then suddenly, up he'd jump and start laying the paint on the canvas like mad. That's why, you know, he looked almost natural, as though he might be asleep, just dropped off. But his eyes were open and he'd just stiffened up. Conan sort of paralyzes you, you know. There isn't any pain. I'd always be glad of that. And he had been painting that morning? Yes. Elsa was sitting on the battlements. There's another bench further up the path towards the house. I was sitting up there for part of the morning. I could see them both. He wouldn't come up to lunch, so I took Elsa in and we left him there staring at the painting. I suppose Elsa and I were the last ones to see him alive. It must have been coming on then. He looked... Uh, I'd rather not talk about it. I'll write it all down for you. It's all coming back to me. Ghosts. Ghosts everywhere. I'll take you up to the house. Then we'll go back. There's something I want you to see. You mean to say that you actually bought the picture he was painting when he died? I just couldn't stand the idea of his being sold for... Well, for its publicity value. A lot of dirty-minded brutes gaping at it. I wanted it here, in my house. Amius said it was the best thing he'd ever done. It was practically finished. He only wanted to work on it another day or so. Anyway, see for yourself. There she is, Elsa Greer. Ah, so much vitality. Such passionate youth. This is what he saw in her. There is a kind of magnificent arrogance. She was so young. Yes, Mr. Blake, but youth is strong. Youth is crude. And youth can often be cruel. Is that how she strikes you? She looks like a woman who is too much alive. Where is she now? Married to a chap called Lord Dittisham. An amateur poet, amongst other things. They live in great style in a house in Mayfair. Money, no object. This little piggy had roast beef. What is it you want of me, Monsieur Poirot? I wish you to go over the past, the past of sixteen years ago. Are you sure it would not be too painful for you? No, not painful. In a way, I wish it were. Why is that? It's so boring and stupid, never to be able to feel anything. At all events, Lady Dietisham, it makes my task very much easier. I don't think there is anything that could hurt me now. I knew that all those years ago at the time of the trial. God, how that old brute de Pleach went for me. But he didn't get the better of me. I enjoyed fighting him. Even in a trial for murder? I hope I'm not upsetting your illusions, Monsieur Poirot. A girl of twenty having an affair with a man twice her age. I suppose I ought to have been agonized with shame or something. I wasn't. I didn't care what they said to me. I only wanted one thing. And what was that? To get her hanged, of course. You hated her so much. Oh, yes. And the passing years have done nothing to change my hatred for her. She knew that Amius loved me, that he was going to leave her for me, and she killed him so that I shouldn't have him. You do not understand or sympathize with jealousy, Lady Dietisham? No, I don't think I do. If you've lost, you've lost. If you can't keep your husband, let him go with a good grace. It's possessiveness I can't understand. You might have understood if you had married Amy Escrail. I don't think so, Monsieur Poirot. There's something I want you to know. Hmm? Don't think that Amy has seduced an innocent young girl. It wasn't like that at all. I met him at a party and I fell for him. And I knew I had to have him. Although he was married... I wasn't the sort to be put off by signs saying trespassers will be prosecuted. If he was unhappy with his wife and could be happy with me, then why not? We've only one life to live. But it has been said he was happy with his wife. No. They quarrelled all the time. She nagged the life out of him. She was a horrible woman. It was a great tragedy. Yes, it was a great tragedy. It killed me. Do you understand? It killed me. Ever since, there's been nothing. Nothing at all. Absolute emptiness. Did Amy Scrail mean so much to you? 
everything in the world. I loved him. I would have made him happy. I want to show you something. To show how we felt about one another, Amius and I. I have kept this letter from Amius with me always. Read it. Elsa, you wonderful child. I have never known anything so beautiful. And yet I'm afraid. I'm too old for you. A middle-aged, foul-tempered devil. I'm no good apart from my work. The best of me is in that. There. Don't say you haven't been warned. But what the hell, my lovely, I'm going to have you all the same. I'd go to the devil for you and you know it. And I'll paint a picture of you that will make a fat-headed world hold its sides and gasp. I'm crazy about you. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm yours forever, Elsa. Yours till death. Yours till death. And that was sixteen years ago. And I'm still alone. Oh, if only you knew. If only you could understand. But that is exactly what I want to do. To see what happened through your eyes. Mr. Philip Blake is writing me a careful account of everything. So is his brother Meredith. Now, if you... You'll get nothing from them. Philip was always stupid. Meredith used to trot round after Caroline, though he was quite a dear. But as for the truth, would you like the truth? Would you like me to write it for you, to show you what she was? She killed him. She killed Amius, who wanted to live so much. Hate ought not to be stronger than love, but her hate was. And my hatred for her is... Yes, Monsieur Poirot. I will write down what happened, but it won't be like the other accounts. Who else are you going to ask? I had thought of talking to the woman who was governess there at the time, a Miss Williams, I believe her name was. I vaguely remember her. A mousy little creature, the kind who never asks anything out of life because she knows she's never going to get it. She won't be able to tell you anything, Monsieur Poirot. This little piggy had none. It's good to have news of little Caroline after all these years. I'm glad she's turned out well. Tell me, is she artistic? I think not. That's one thing to be thankful for. There is something I would like to ask you about, Hell, Miss Williams. Hmm? Whenever I have mentioned her name, the response always comes as a, a vague surprise. I saw the person to whom I am speaking has forgotten altogether that there was a child. Now, can you explain that? You've put your finger on a vital point, Monsieur Poirot. Mr. and Mrs. Crail were so wrapped up in one another that there were times when nobody seemed to notice that little Caroline existed. I don't mean that she was neglected in any way, but for all her care for her daughter, the only thing that really mattered in Mrs. Crail's life was her husband. She existed, one might say, only in him and for him. You mean that they were more like lovers than like husband and wife? You could. Certainly put it that way. He was devoted to her as she was to him? They were a devoted couple. But he, of course, was a man. Oh, you hold no brief for men? Men have the best of this world. I hope that it will not always be so. You did not like him, Miss Crail? I did not like him, nor did I approve of him. If I were his wife, I should have left him. There are things that no woman should put up with. You liked Mrs. Crail? I was very fond of Mrs. Crail. Very fond of her? And very sorry for And her. your pupil, Angela Warren. She was a remarkable girl. One of the most interesting pupils I've ever had. A really good brain. I always hoped that she would accomplish something worthwhile. And she has. You've read her book on the Sahara. Uh, well, I... And uh, she investigated those very interesting tombs in the Fayum. I shall always be proud that I helped to stimulate her mind and encourage her taste for archaeology. I understand that it was decided to continue her education by sending her away to school. You must have resented that. Not at all, Monsieur Poirot. I thoroughly concurred with it. Angela was a dear girl, really a very dear girl, warm-hearted and impulsive. But she was also what I call a difficult girl. That is, she was at a difficult age. The age when a girl is neither a child nor a woman. Exactly. One moment Angela would be sensible and mature, quite grown up, in fact, but a minute later she would relapse into being a spoiled child, being rude and losing her temper and playing mischievous tricks. 
You've heard, no doubt, of the things she did to Mr. Graham. Mm, like putting slugs in his bed? Yes. He had a particular aversion for slugs. <laughs> and, and there was another thing which really annoyed him. He had a habit of tossing down his drinks in one gulp, and she once put a lot of salt into his glass. The whole thing, of course, acted as an emetic, and he was speechless with fury. But the slugs were the last straw. And that was why she was sent away to school? Yes. He said he wasn't going to put up with any more nonsense. Angela was terribly upset, although she'd said more than once that she wanted to go to boarding school. But she chose to make a huge grievance of it, and she would hit out at Mr. Crail whenever it took her fancy to do so. It wasn't really serious, you understand, but it made a kind of undercurrent to to everything else that was going on. Ah, you mean Elsa Greer? Exactly. Elsa Greer. And what was your opinion of her? I had no opinion of her at all. Thoroughly unprincipled young woman. Mr. Crail's death must have been a terrible shock to her. Oh, it was. And she herself was entirely to blame for it. I don't go as far as condoning murder. But all the same, Monsieur Poirot, if ever a woman was driven to breaking point, that woman was Caroline Crail. I tell you frankly, there were moments when I would have liked to murder them both myself. She was goaded beyond endurance. And I, for one, do not blame her for what she did. You were with Mrs. Crail when she found her husband's body, I believe. Yes. She and I went down from the house together after lunch. Andrew had left her pullover on the beach after bathing, or else in the boat. She was always very careless about her things. I parted from Mrs. Crail at the door of the battery garden, but she called me back almost at once. I believe Mr. Crail had been dead over an hour. He was sprawled on the bench near his easel. And how did Mrs. Crail seem... Was she terribly upset? What exactly do you mean by that, Monsieur Poirot? I am asking you what your impressions were at the time, Miss Williams. Oh, I see. She seemed quite dazed. She sent me off to telephone for the doctor. After all, one couldn't be absolutely sure he was dead. It might have been a cataleptic seizure. So, you went and telephoned? I had gone halfway up the path when I met Mr. Meredith Blake. I entrusted my errand to him and returned to Mrs. Crail. Hmm. I thought, you see, she might have collapsed. And had she? Mrs. Crail was quite in command of herself. She was very different from Miss Greer, who made a very hysterical scene. Ah, what kind of scene? She tried to attack Mrs. Crail. You killed him! You poisoned him! You crazy, jealous bitch! You wanted to keep him all to yourself! And Mrs. Crail, how did she react to that? I cannot tell you what she felt or thought at that moment. No, no, but how did she seem? Stunned and frightened, I think. But that is natural enough. Natural enough. Perhaps. What view did she adopt officially as to her husband's death? Suicide. She said very definitely from the first that it must be suicide. And did you believe that, Miss Williams? No. No, I did not. But please understand, Monsieur Poirot, that my sympathies were entirely with Mrs. Crail. You would have liked to see her acquitted? Most certainly I would. Whatever she may have done, hers was not the blame. So you can sympathize very well with her daughter's feelings about her mother? Of course I can. Mm. Would you have any objection to writing out a detailed account of the tragedy? For her daughter to read? Yes. Oh, I dare say it would have been preferable if the truth had been kept from her. No. It is always better to face the truth. Once she knows about it, she'll be able to put it behind her and go on living her own life. Ah, but you see, mademoiselle, there is more to it than that. She not only wants to know what happened, she wants her mother to be proved innocent. Poor child. Is that what you think? To wish to find her mother innocent is a natural hope. You do not consider but... that there is even a possibility that Mrs. Cray was innocent? Monsieur Poirot, what is the point of going against the facts? But... Can you really be so certain? Yes, Monsieur Poirot. It doesn't matter my saying this now, so long afterwards. You see, I happen to know that Caroline Crail was guilty. But how? Tell me. No, I cannot tell you, but I will write it. Ah, very well, mademoiselle. I shall await your account with the greatest interest. Is it your intention to talk to Angela Warren? She is to deliver a lecture to the Royal Geographical Society in three days' time. I hope she will agree to talk to me. She is a brave woman. But then she always was. 
ever since that dreadful accident which left her half blind. Please remember me to her. The last of my little pigs. But this time the rhyme is not appropriate. I am sure that Angela Warren would not have cried wee, wee, wee all the way home. Of course, Carla's right to try and prove her mother was innocent. Caroline didn't do it. I've always known that. You surprise me very much, Mademoiselle Warren. Everybody else I have spoken uh, to... They didn't know her as I did. I don't care about the circumstantial evidence. I just know quite simply and definitely that my sister couldn't have killed anyone. Can one say that with certainty of any human creature? In most cases, probably not. But as far as Caroline was concerned, there were special reasons. Reasons which I have a better chance of appreciating than anyone else could. You see the scar on my face? I know you've been politely trying not to notice it, but take a good look at it. Monsieur Poirot, I have lost the sight of my right eye. It was Caroline's doing. And that is why I'm certain. I know that she didn't do the murder. It would be a convincing argument to the contrary for many people. It was used in that way at the trial, I believe, as evidence that Caroline had a violent and ungovernable temper. Because she had injured me as a baby, the prosecution urged that she would be equally capable of poisoning an unfaithful husband. Well, I at least appreciate the difference, mademoiselle. A sudden fit of ungovernable rage does not lead you first to steal a poison and then use it deliberately the following day. Oh, that's not what I mean at all. No? Suppose that you are a person normally affectionate and basically kind, but that you are also liable to intense jealousy. And suppose that at a time in your life when self-control is most difficult, in a fit of blind rage you come near to committing what is in effect murder. Think of the horror that would seize on you once that fit of rage was over. I understand. Caroline was haunted, continually haunted by the fact that she had injured me. It coloured everything she did. Nothing was too good for me. In her eyes, I must always come first. Half the quarrels she had with Amias were on my account. I was inclined to be jealous of him and played all kinds of tricks on him. I pinched cat stuff to put in his drink and once put a hedgehog in his bed. But Caroline was always on my side and, and was always watching herself, always on guard that something of that kind might happen again. And yet she was heard on several occasions threatening to kill Amy Gray. But that's just it. She felt that if she were violent enough in speech, she wouldn't be violent in action. It was her way of giving it a natural outlet. She and Amias used to have the most fantastic quarrels. Mm, like cat and dog, it was said. What nobody appreciated was that they enjoyed quarrelling. Living that way with continual rows and making up was their idea of fun. Do you see what I mean? Mm, I see perfectly. May I ask you, mademoiselle, what were your own feelings at the time? It was like a terrible nightmare. Caroline was arrested about three days after the murder. But her only concern was for me. She wanted me kept right away from it all. She got Miss Williams to take me away to relations almost at once. The police had no objections. And when it was decided that my evidence would not be needed, arrangements were made for me to go to school abroad. And were you abroad when the verdict was given? They wouldn't let me go near her. Caroline wouldn't allow it. I never saw her again. Tell me, mademoiselle, what do you think really happened? I suppose that, as Caroline said, Amius must have committed suicide. What? Is that likely? From what you know of his character? Very unlikely. But what other explanation is there? You cannot see one? You mean one of the other people killed him? That it was cold-blooded murder? It is a possibility that we should consider. Who of those intimately concerned would have wanted to get rid of Amius Crail, hmm? Elsa Greer, Meredith Blake, Philip Blake... I... Yes, Miss Warren? You have something to say about Philip Blake? Do you know the way things suddenly come back to you? After years, perhaps. Things that didn't mean anything at the time, perhaps because you were too young. And then they suddenly fall into place. I understand what you mean, mademoiselle. 
Some time ago, I was staying at an hotel. As I walked along a corridor, one of the bedroom doors opened, and a woman I knew came out. It was not her bedroom, and she registered the fact plainly on her face when she saw me. And then I knew the meaning of the expression I had once seen on Caroline's face at Alderbury, when she came out of Philip Blake's room one night. But that is quite astonishing. From Philip Blake himself, I got the impression that he disliked your sister and had always done so. I can't explain it, but there it is. Hmm. I felt at the time that his animosity did not altogether ring true. Meredith Blake told me that his brother did not go and see Amias and Caroline for nearly a year after they were married. Could it have been because he was jealous? I can't tell you. I don't understand it. You see, I, I've no experience in love affairs. They, they haven't come my way. I thought it might just have some bearing on what happened. It certainly puts things in a very different light. But will it help to prove your sister's innocence? I am certain that she didn't do it, Monsieur Poirot. How can you be so sure? After the verdict, she wrote me a letter. I have never shown it to anyone, but I think I would like you to read it. It may help you understand the kind of person she was. And have you found out the truth about what happened? Ah, that would be a little too much to hope for at this stage, Mademoiselle Carla. So what have you found? I have received the five statements about the murder. Mister Caleb Jonathan prophesied that I would find five different accounts of five different murders, and yet, although the angle of each is different, everyone is agreed on the main facts. You mean they all agree that my mother killed my father? Doesn't anyone think she was innocent? Ah, but it is the facts which interest me, Mademoiselle. Are they necessarily what everyone believes them to have been? Each of the accounts contains something which does not quite fit into the picture. What kind of things? The first concerns the morning of the murder. It is Meredith Blake's account of how he came to find that the coin was missing. I had slept very badly. After a long wakeful period, I fell into a heavy sleep about six a.m. and woke up at about half past nine. I thought I heard movements in the laboratory. I went down and I found the window sash raised a little way. It had probably been left from the day before, and the sound I heard had almost certainly been a cat. It was then that I noticed that the conine jar was nearly empty. A cat. Very curious, don't you think? I don't see what it's got to do with anything. It interests me. But let us see what Philip Blake has to say about that morning. He also slept late. By the time I came down, the dining room was empty. I went to see if I could find anybody outside and encountered Miss Williams running about looking for Angela. I went back into the hall. I could hear Caroline and Amias having a great set to in the library. You and your women! I'd like to kill you. Some day I will kill you. Now it seems that Elsa Greer also overheard this conversation, but a rather different one. Understand this, Caroline. Nothing's going to stop me. Do as you please. I've warned you. What's that supposed to mean? You're mine, and I don't mean to let you go. Sooner than let you go to that girl, I'll kill you. And then the phone rang in the hall. It was Meredith Blake. He told his brother about the missing coin. They agreed to meet at the landing stage, and they walked up towards the house, discussing what they should do. As we came up to the Battery Garden, we could hear Caroline and Amias having a disagreement of some kind. I think that Caroline was pleading with him not to send Angela off to boarding school. It's very hard on the girl. Can't you see that? Amias, however, was adamant, shouting out irritably that it was all settled. He'd see to her packing. Elsa came down the path at that moment, and as Amias clearly wanted to get on with the sitting, I went on up the path and sat myself on a bench overlooking the battery, watching Elsa as she stood posing for Amias. Can't you keep still, damn it? Must you wave your arms about like that? I've been holding this pose for simply ages. I'm stiff. You're not nearly as stiff as I am. It's been muscular rheumatism. You poor old man! Don't tell me I'm taking on a creaking invalid. 
But what about the actual poisoning? What do they have to say about that? Elsa Greer says that your mother poured the bottle of beer into your father's glass and stood there watching him drink it. Amy has drank it down the way he always drank beer, pouring it down his throat in one draught. <laughs> Everything tastes foul today. At any rate, it was cold. And even then, when he said that, no suspicion entered my head. I just laughed and said, "Liver." It never occurred to me that there was something wrong with the beer. If I'd known, if I'd realised, perhaps a doctor would have saved him. It's no good thinking of that now. But what difference does any of this make? It doesn't change anything. You do not see. The facts are still exactly the same. What about Miss Williams? She wasn't as closely involved as the others. Didn't she notice anything? In many ways, her account is the most interesting of all. For example, she tells of a violent quarrel between your father and Angela on the night before the murder. I have no doubt that Angela sensed the tension in the air and that it reacted on her as much as anyone else. It all ended with her flinging a paperweight at Mr. Crail and dashing out of the room. A paperweight? Hmm. Curious, is it not? On the morning of the murder, I went into Angela's room before going down to breakfast, but she was already up and out. I picked up a torn skirt which she'd left lying on the floor and took it down with me for her to mend. She had already gone out, and I went in search of her. Her bathing dress was missing, and accordingly I went down to the beach. There was no sign of her, so I conceived it possible that she'd gone over to Handcross Manor. I did not find her there, and I eventually returned. Angela was in the conservatory by the refrigerator and was taking out a bottle of beer. Mrs. Crail came up from the battery to get a drink for her husband. Amy says he wants one that's cold. It is difficult to know whether I should have suspected anything from Mrs. Crail's manner, but I must admit that at that moment I was intent not on her but on Angela. I am glad to say that she looked red and rather guilty. Miss Williams is certain that my mother did it, isn't she? I am afraid that she is, and she believes that she has positive proof. What kind of positive proof? Ah, you must forgive me, Mademoiselle, but for the moment I wish to keep that to myself. I need to give it some thought. So all we're left with is Aunt Angela, and she unfortunately has only the most indistinct memories of that time. I've just a vague recollection of summer days and isolated incidents, but I couldn't say for certain what summer they happened. Even does she give any reason at all why she's so sure my mother didn't do it? Yes, she does. There is a letter which your mother wrote to her from prison. Angela considers it to be a proof of her innocence. Can I see the letter? I shall ask her to bring it to a little reunion. I'm planning a reunion. Hmm. I propose to hold a little gathering at Handcross Manor of all those who were at Alderbury at the time of the murder. I have written to Mr. Meredith Blake. May I come? Of course, Mademoiselle. And I have asked Mr. Blake to hang on the wall Amy Crail's portrait of Elsa Greer. It seemed appropriate. So that my father can be there in spirit. Exactly. Oh, there is one surprising thing I learned from Elsa Greer's account. What's that? After the trial, Meredith Blake asked her to marry him.、Oh. Strange, is it not? But nothing has changed. I feel like a schoolgirl again. I'm so very proud of you, my dear.、Uh, to think that a pupil of mine—you must be Miss Williams—and you are Carla. What a very happy occasion this would be if it were not for the macabre circumstances. Couldn't agree more. What the devil is all this, Poirot? Let us call it an excursion into the past, an excursion where we shall finally lay the ghosts. For who is to say that Amias and Caroline Crail are not here, listening and waiting? Your last princess is here, Monsieur Poirot, Lady Ditisham. I hope I have not kept you waiting, Monsieur Poirot. It was very good of you to come, Madame. I wouldn't have known you, Angela. How long is it? Sixteen years. Yes, it is sixteen years since the events of which we are to speak. Sixteen years—a long time for the ashes to settle on a murder. I hope you're not going to subject us to a flowery speech, Poirot. If we must go into it all again, let's get it over as quickly and painlessly as possible. We all know what happened, so why don't we skip the preamble? Very well, Mr. Blake. You say we all know what happened, but are the facts as generally accepted really correct? For example, you have stated that you hated Caroline Crail, but I have reason to believe that you were violently attracted to her. What the devil do you mean by that? She was observed coming out of your room at Alderbury at a somewhat compromising hour. Who told you that? Does not matter who told me. It makes no difference to anything. 
Yes, I'd always been in love with Caroline, but she never took the least notice of me. Then when Amos lost his head over Elsa Greer... Hmm. Yes, Mr. Blake? Caroline was in a mood when a woman can very easily be won. She agreed to come to my room, and then... Then she told me it was no good. She was Amos Crails, for better or worse. And she left me. Do you wonder that I never forgave her? Oh. And your brother, Mr. Meredith Blake, has been cast as Caroline Crail's devoted friend. But, in fact, that devotion had worn itself thin by the time of the murder. It was Elsa Greer who was occupying his thoughts. But surely this has nothing to do with the issue? Has it not? Sadly, there are many things everyone failed to see at the time of the trial, and the first of these was that at no time did Caroline Crail protest her innocence. Why should she? She didn't have a leg to stand on. There are certain facts, however, that are beyond dispute. I do not think there is any doubt that it was Mrs. Crail who took the coin from the laboratory. You have all confirmed Elsa Crail's revelation of the fact that she and Amy Crail were contemplating marriage, and Mrs. Crail's deep distress. She behaved with great dignity. I have never seen anything like the look of scorn Mrs. Crail gave her husband. So, now we come to the morning of the fatal day. There is a scene between husband and wife in the library. Caroline is overheard saying you and your women in a bitter voice and finally going on to say someday I'll kill you. I distinctly heard her say that. I was in the hall. So far, there is nothing that seems psychologically incorrect. Everyone has behaved much as they might be expected to behave, but now we come to something that is incongruous. Meredith Blake discovers the loss of the poison. He meets his brother at the landing stage, and they come up past the battery garden where Caroline Crail is having a discussion with her husband about Angela's going to school. That is correct? Yes, that's so, but what's all about it? Ah, does it not strike you as strange that twenty minutes after a terrific row when she has threatened to kill him, Mrs. Crail and her husband should be having a trivial domestic argument concerning Angela? According to Meredith Blake, the words he overheard Crail say were, I'll see to her packing. That is right. It was something like that, yes. Yes, Amy said something about packing, and Caroline said something about it being very hard on the girl. Anyway, what does it matter? We all knew that Angela was off to school in a day or two. But why should Amy as Crail pack for the girl? It is absurd. There was Mrs. Crail, there was Miss Williams, there was a housemaid. Oh, what does it matter? It has nothing to do with the crime. You think not? For me, it was the first point that struck me as suggestive, and it is immediately followed by another. Mrs. Crail, a desperate woman who is certainly contemplating either suicide or murder, now offers, in the most amicable manner, to bring her husband down some iced beer. But surely, if she was going to kill him, that's just what she would do. Dissimulate. You think so? Very well. Caroline Crail goes up to the house fetches a bottle from the conservatory and takes it down to her husband. He drinks it down, and what does he say? Everything tastes foul today. Ah, mm. But curious, is it not? And now we come to something which was not brought to the attention of the authorities at the time. After lunch, Mrs. Crail finds her husband dead. She sends Miss Williams off for a doctor, but Miss Williams meets Meredith Blake and asks him to telephone. She returns to the battery garden and... Tell us what you saw, Miss Williams. You are sure you really wish me to do this? Quite sure, Miss Williams. Very well. I saw Mrs. Crail wiping the beer bottle clean with her handkerchief, and then she pressed the fingers of her dead husband onto the bottle. You actually saw her do I that? I don't believe it. But that settles it. That settles it once and for all. Yes, Mr. Blake. It was the one thing which made me see that Caroline Crail was not guilty, could not possibly be guilty. But, my What dear, does Miss Williams see? Mrs. Crail wiping fingerprints from the bottle. What Mrs. Crail did not know was that the cognine was not in the bottle. The police found no trace of it. The poison was in the glass. Then why? Yes, why? Why did Caroline Crail try so desperately to establish the theory of suicide? The answer is quite simple. Because she knew who had poisoned him and she was willing to do anything, endure anything, rather than let that person be suspected. Oh, Miss Warren, I requested that you bring your sister's letter. Do you have it? Yes, I, I do. I should like you to read it aloud to us. No. Surely. I realise perfectly well what you are suggesting. 
that I killed Amias Crail and that my sister knew it. I deny that allegation utterly. Nevertheless... That letter was meant for my eyes only. It was written by my mother. I have a right to speak for her. I want that letter read. Very well, Carla. Since you ask it, I cannot very well refuse. My darling little Angela, you will hear bad news and you will grieve. But what I want to impress upon you is that it is all right. I have never told you lies, and I don't now, when I say that I am actually happy, that I feel a peace that I have never known before. It's all right, darling. It's all right. Don't look back and regret and grieve for me. Go on with your life and succeed. You can, I know. I've told you I'm happy. One has to pay one's debts. It's lovely to feel so peaceful. You will notice one striking omission. Nowhere is there any protestation of innocence. There was no need for it. Yes, Miss Warren. Caroline Crail had no need to tell her sister that she was innocent. She thought that her sister knew that fact only too well. I don't see what you're driving at. All Caroline Crail was concerned about was to prevent any possibility of a confession from Angela. Her sister must be encouraged to live her life to be happy and successful. And so that the burden may not be too great, she ends on that very significant phrase, one must pay one's debts. What debts? What did she mean by that? The burden that Caroline Crail had carried for so many years, ever since in a fit of uncontrolled adolescent rage she hurled a paperweight at her baby sister and scarred her for life. And Angela threw a paperweight at Amias Crail the night before his death. And dead. she shouted that she wished he was dead. And when Caroline Crail went to get the bottle of beer on that last day, she saw Angela standing by the refrigerator with a guilty expression on her face. And after Amias' death... You mean she thought Angela had done it? If one accepts that assumption as true, everything else falls into place. But if I'd done it, I wouldn't have kept silent. I'd never have let Caroline suffer for what I'd done. Did you put anything in that bottle? Of course I didn't. According to his account, Meredith Blake heard sounds coming from his laboratory on the morning of the crime. Yes. It was a cat. You're certain? The window was open. And there was a smell of cats about the place. A smell of cats. And that morning Angela went bathing early, but Miss Williams could not find her on the beach. I suggest that she swam across here, got through the window, and took something from the shelf. But it can't have been that morning. At least I... Ah, you have remembered. You told me, did you not, that to play a joke on Amy's Crail, you once stole what you called cat stuff. Valerian, of course. That was what I smelled. And Miss Warren stole Valerian to put in Amy Crail's beer. But I never associated it with that day. I remember taking it. I remember going to the fridge and getting a bottle of beer. Caroline came in just as I was unscrewing the bottle. You mean to say that she thought it was me? But I didn't kill him. If I thought that she believed that, I, I would have spoken out. Surely you don't think that I murdered him? Of course not. Nobody but a fool would think that. Hercule Poirot is not a fool, Miss Williams. I know very well who killed Amias Crail. Oh. <gasps> there is always a danger of accepting facts as proved which are really nothing of the kind. Let us take the situation at Alderbury. Two women and one man. We have taken it for granted that Amy Oscrail proposed to leave his wife for the other woman. But I suggest to you now that he never intended to do anything of the kind. Oh, but damn it, old man. We all heard him say so. He may have said so, but many women had obsessed him while they lasted. Elsa Greer was not a woman. She was a young girl. And in love, she was frighteningly single-minded. Because she herself had a deep and overwhelming passion for Amy Oscrail, she assumed that he had the same for her. She assumed without asking him that he was going to leave his wife. But why should he let her go on believing that? It is quite simple. He wanted to finish that picture. Oh, mm. To Amy Crail, you see, everything is simple. He is painting a picture, slightly encumbered by what he sees as a couple of jealous neurotic women, but neither of them is going to be allowed to interfere with what to him is the most important thing in life. You mean that he never intended to leave Caroline at all? Oh, perhaps in the first flash of his feelings he did talk of leaving her, but I believe that his wife was the only person he cared about at all, and I think that after that scene when Elsa proclaimed to the world at large that they were going to get married, he became seriously worried. The following morning, 
The morning of his death, he told Caroline that once he had finished the picture, he would never see Elsa Greer again. But I distinctly heard her say, you and your women, someday I'll kill you. Exactly. Because she was revolted by his callousness and his cruelty to the girl. But what he did not know was that Elsa Greer had been just outside the library window and had heard every word. Imagine the shock it must have been to her to hear the truth so brutally spoken. Mm. Meredith Blake, on that afternoon when you showed your guests around your laboratory, you have stated that Caroline Crail was the last to leave. Yes, that is correct. And you had your back to her? Yes. What were you doing? I was talking to Elsa. Which means that she could see over your shoulder Caroline taking the poison. She was the only person who could do so. She said nothing, but she remembered it as she stood outside the library listening to Amy as saying that he would get rid of her. When he came out and asked her to pose for him, she made the excuse of wanting to get a pullover and went up to Caroline's room to look for that poison. But I thought you said that Caroline's were the only prints found on the bottle she'd put the poison in. Elsa Greer drew off the fluid into a pipette, which was later found crushed on the gravel path. She went down to the battery garden and squeezed it into a glass of beer which she poured out for him, and no doubt he tossed it back in his usual way. She went back to the house, this time genuinely to fetch a pullover, and Caroline Crail took the opportunity to tackle him about Elsa. It's very hard on the girl, can't you see that? I don't give a damn how foul Elsa's been to me. You can't treat her like this. You're being unbelievably cruel. The poor creature's in love with you. I don't give a damn. It's got nothing to do with you. It's all settled. I'll send the girl packing. Now leave me alone and let me get on with the picture. Of course. I remembered it all wrong. I thought he was talking about Angela. Elsa returns, cool and smiling, and takes up the pose once more. Already she has counted upon Caroline being suspected and the scent bottle with the traces of quinine being found in her room. But now Caroline plays into her hands completely. She goes off to get a bottle of iced beer for Amy's Crail. And he drinks it down and says, Everything tastes foul today. Do you not see how significant that remark is? Everything tastes foul. Because there had been something before which had tasted wrong. Exactly. And, Monsieur Philippe, what was it that you said about him as Crail? Uh, uh, that he was staggering a little as if he'd been drinking. It was the first side of the conine working. Which confirms that it had already been administered to him some time before Caroline Crail brought him the bottle of iced beer. And Elsa just sat there posing. I saw her. She waved to me. And Amias Crail, a man who detested illness and refused to give in to it, painted doggedly on till his limbs failed and his speech thickened and he sprawled there on the bench, helpless, but his mind still clear. But did he know, do you think? Did my father realise that he'd been poisoned? Ah, we cannot be certain. But his hand and eye were faithful to the end. Look at that picture over there. The picture of Elsa Greer. I should have realized at once when I saw it for the first time, for it is very remarkable. It is the portrait of a murderess painted by her victim, the picture of a girl watching her lover die. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Take them out of here, Meredith. Leave me alone with Monsieur Poirot. If that is what you wish, we will wait in the sitting room. <clears throat> so, what do you expect me to do, Monsieur Poirot? Confess, because I shall do nothing of the kind. But what we say here, you and I, does not matter because it is only a question of your word against mine. Exactly. I want to know, what do you propose to do about me? I shall lay my conclusions before the proper authorities. If they consider there is the possibility of making out a case against you, they may act. A case against me? Where is your evidence? Oh, I know. There are only inferences, not facts. Moreover, Lady Ditchisham, they will not be able to proceed against anyone in your position unless there is ample justification. I shouldn't care if I was standing in the dock, fighting for my life. 
There might be something in that. I might enjoy it. Your husband would not. Do you think I care in the least what my husband would feel? No, I do not. I do not think you have ever in your life cared about what any other person would feel. If you had, you might be happier. You almost sound as if you were sorry for me. I am sorry for you, my child, because you have so much to learn. What have I to learn? All the grown-up emotions. Pity, sympathy, understanding. The only things you know, have ever known, are love and hate. I saw Caroline take the conine. I knew she intended to kill herself. That would have simplified things. And then, the next morning, I heard Amius tell her that he really didn't care a button about me. That once the picture was finished, he'd send me packing. And do you know what was the worst of all? Mm, she was sorry for you. Can you understand what that did to me? It wasn't difficult to find the stuff in her room. I gave it to him, and I sat there, watching him die. I've never felt so alive, so exultant, so full of power. And then? What I didn't realize was that I was killing myself. Not him. Afterwards, at the trial, I saw her caught in a trap. I should have enjoyed that, but I felt nothing. And she'd somehow escaped from it all. She was in a world of her own. She and Amius both escaped. They went somewhere where I couldn't get at them. But they didn't die. I died. I died, Monsieur Poirot. Is there anything you can do to clear my mother's name? I shall do everything I can to persuade the authorities to grant her a posthumous free pardon. Oh, I can't tell you how grateful I am, Monsieur Poirot. I knew you were the only person who could do it. Oh, C'est très gentil. <laughs> now you can get married without fear, mademoiselle. I shall insist that you come to our wedding. You will come, won't you? It will be an honor. Uh, do you know when it will be? In six months' time, I hope. Excellent. That will give me time to take a little vacance, a holiday, where I shall leave all thought of crimes and murders far behind me. An excursion by steamer up the Nile. In Agatha Christie's Five Little Pigs, dramatized for radio by Michael Bakewell, Hercule Poirot was played by John Moffat. Meredith Blake, Graham Crowden. Philip Blake, Derek Waring. Miss Williams, Carmel McSharry. Angela, Charlotte Attenborough. Elsa Greer, Susie Aitchison. Caroline Crail, Gemma Churchill. Amos Crail, John Hartley. Carla Le Marchand, Claire Hayhoe. Sir Montague de Pleach, John Woodnut, and Caleb Jonathan, David Kossoff. The director was Enid Williams. <laughs> <laughs>